Father, right now we just want to pause for a moment to just again invite your presence here. Lord, we've come to open your word again and we just want you to speak to us. Lord, if there's some things that we need understanding, Lord, please send your spirit to give us discernment and understanding and wisdom. Father, we don't have all the answers, but we have your word. And we're opening that word again tonight. Just please, Lord, fill us now with your presence, we pray. Amen. I was 19 years old, maybe pushing 20, when I first started to date Judy, my wife. She's a couple years younger than me. I keep getting accused of robbing the cradle, but that's okay. It was wintertime. We were in school in Southern California. And Judy was the proud owner of a brand new 1968 VW Bug. It was a thing of beauty. I had a junker old car. <laughs> And it was a Sabbath afternoon, a Saturday afternoon. We decided we're going to go. We're going to go into Palm Springs. We're going to take a, take a ride up the tram up to the top of that mountain. It's a gorgeous view up there. However, it was one of those Southern California rainy sessions, and it was raining hard. We said, we'll still go. So we take Interstate 10 going towards Palm Springs, and we know what extra to take. And that rain is coming down hard. I didn't see the little amber flashing light on the side of the road that said, caution, flash flood ahead. You guys here in Arizona know what flash floods look like, don't you? I came over a little rise and there it was. It was a river. Just moving across it. I hit that, that water, probably doing 60 miles an hour. That poor little Volkswagen was bouncing along. And of course, the, the, the momentum of the water pushed us right into a bank. A window, and my head hits the window. The, the wind, this is before seat belts were really cool. Anyway, the window is shattered. The front end is all bent up. I get out, I'm in knee-deep water, and oh, Lord. Judy's looking at her new little car. Guys came help us, get us, get it out of the, the sand mud bank there. Got it on the, in the safety area. Wouldn't you know that little bug was still okay to drive? <laughs> but the problem was it was still raining really hard, and the windshield was so shattered that we couldn't see anything out of it. And so we took that rubber gasket around that little flat, you know, little, remember the little VW front windows? And, and wouldn't you know that providentially we'd been skiing, snow skiing a few days before, and there was still a pair of goggles in the back seat of the car. <laughs> we weren't going into Palm Springs now, we were heading home. And I tell you, I wish we'd had a video camera back in the day. So here I am, driving back down to La Sierra, down that freeway, the, no windshield with the goggles on. <laughs> we had people driving past us, what in the world? <laughs> it was a sight for sore eyes, let me tell you. We have laughed about that so many times. But the point is this, it was my fault. I ignored a sign. The sign was there. Sometimes we get pre too preoccupied and too busy and, and we miss stuff like that. It can be critical. Well, tonight, nearly 2,000 years ago, we find some astonished, astonishing accurate warnings, warning signs, accurate prophecies concerning Christ that I want to share with you. You see, question we need to ask ourselves, what are the warning signs that are in our world today? 
Friends, there are some warning signs today that you cannot ignore. If you do, you're a fool. They're so blatant, they're so there. How do we face the future? Do we face it with fear or unafraid? Well, a lot of it has to do with our point of reference. And we're going to find out about that tonight. I'm sure there's some of you here that have probably even listened to this, but in 1938, there was a special Halloween radio drama. Now, this is back in the day in the 30s. Everything was live. You didn't have any, you know, canned, you know, programming. It was all done live. I had the chance when I was in college, I, was in a, I worked at a radio station. We went to one of the old radio museums and we saw the, 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 the equipment and the, and the props that they used to make the, make the sound, galloping horse and, you know, all the different sound effects. And there was a very well-known actor, dramatist, his name is Orson Welles. And he aired from New York much of it was presented as news bulletins. This live, and they'd, they'd cut into programming that whole night on, on, on Halloween that suggested to the listeners that an actual invasion was taking place by Martians there in New York. Now, this was supposed to be a gag. This was supposed to be a joke. But it was so realistic, it was made so real by the radio actors that many in the listening audience believed that story was true and they were actually being attacked by Martians. You can actually pull that thing up on, if you go on the internet, you can actually listen to that whole scenario. Panic, fear is an understatement. It gripped not only across New York, but all of the station, all the cities around that area that, that had access to listening to that big radio station. Many attempted suicide. Some fled to the remote areas. They got in their cars or they got on horseback, or whatever, and they got out of they got out of Dodge as quickly as they could. The Navy even canceled shore leave for all of their fleet in New York Harbor. You guys aren't going aboard. We're in trouble. Amazing. But it was all just fiction. It was all just made up. Martians had not invaded. And it wasn't, it wasn't the end of life on Earth, as the program suggested. Just curious, have any of you ever listened to that program? Have you ever heard it? Well, some of you are probably going to do some Googling tonight or tomorrow. But here's the thing. The question of how the world will end has fascinated men and women, has fascinated generations throughout the millennia. You know, today there's concern in our world that global warming or climate change or whatever they call it, they keep changing, whatever they call it. You know, first it was the ice age and then it's warming. Anyway, I won't go down that road. But, but eventually, life on this planet, climate change is going to destroy planet Earth. Some fear that we're going to destroy ourselves by some big, huge nuclear war, a nuclear holocaust. And others say that will run out of food and other resources, and world population continues to explode. People by the millions, billions are going to starve to death. Still others suggest that we're going to be wiped out as a huge comet or asteroid <laughs> collides with planet Earth. There are lots of theories out there and there's a lot, of, and there are a lot of plenty of other things to worry about as well. So people have a right to have fear in the vocabulary and uncertainty. But there are certain people on this planet who face those fears and uncertainty with great courage and great hope. And there's a huge difference in their belief system. So us, as we're sitting here tonight, we all struggle with just trying to make a living with sickness, with grief, with death. Those things are surrounding us all the time. And for, any of us, for many of us, life isn't really that easy. 
especially the last few years. I have lost so many friends and colleagues and kids I went to school with, dear cousins. I mean, life has been really, really tough. And sometimes people without much hope get to a place where they're wishing, they're wishing that it would end. That really life is not that worth living for. You probably know people in that category. Friends, life wasn't made to be full of pain and hunger and weariness and stress. All of us want a better world. Would you say amen? amen. Well, here it is, my friend. There's good news. Yes, this world is going to end. But there is a better world coming. Amen. But just how will this old world end? I'd like to suggest, well, there's no shortage of prophets and self, self-made self soothsayers. And you go down to some of the big cities, go down to San Francisco, down the Fisherman's Wharf there, and you got this, you got the tarot cards and you got the, you got the palm readers. There's a whole bunch of them out there. They're not afraid to give you their prediction. But the problem is that most of their prophecies and most of their predictions aren't coming true. So how can we trust? Where, what predictions can we trust? Friends, I'm so glad to tell you tonight there is someone whose prophecies have come true every last one of them. And we're going to deal with that, these end time signs tonight. One day, Jesus and his disciples, they were in Jerusalem. The disciples were commenting on the magnificent temple. Now, I would have loved to have seen the temple before it was destroyed. You know, they rebuilt it, but I would love to get, I'd love to see that temple that is described as probably one of the most beautiful edifices ever constructed. And this temple was, had just been enlarged and embellished by the Roman government. Gazing at this incredible edifice, Jesus makes a startling statement to his disciples when he said in Matthew 24, Do you see all these things? And he's pointing out, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon the other that shall not be thrown down. Now, this was the greatest building in the Jewish nation. And here Jesus is predicting that it would be destroyed completely. Now, the disciples, they're a little bit shocked. They're surprised. And as they went up to the Mount of Olives, they asked Jesus a question that all of us would have asked Jesus had we been there. We find in the book of Matthew 24, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us when these things will be. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? You, you see, the disciples were sure that Jerusalem, with its temple, was destined to last forever. And that one day it would be, it would rule, they would rule the nations till the end of the world. They were confident that the destruction that Jesus was foretelling had to take place when the whole world was destroyed. You get the picture? Literal Israel was what they were hoping for. But as we study this passage more closely, we find that Jesus spoke really about two different events. I'd like to comment on those this evening. One of them was the second coming. His return to this earth in glory and his establishment of an everlasting kingdom here on this planet earth. And the other one, however, was the one that would be seen by many people alive at that very time. That would be the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and of the temple. You see the two different uh, contrasts there? So he's speaking of those two events. And now Jesus proceeds to tell the disciples what was going to happen to the temple. This temple that Solomon, well, 
Anyway, no, no videos of it, but I'd love to see it. So he says in Matthew, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads it, let him understand. We don't have time to spend a lot of time in that verse, but there's a lot there. But then he continues, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What he's saying is that when you see this destruction of Jerusalem starting to happen, you better get out of Dodge. You better get out of town because the things are going to get really, really bad. Daniel had predicted that Jerusalem would be destroyed. And now Jesus reminds his disciples that the prophet Daniel's writing would soon be fulfilled. He says in Matthew 24, 17 and 18, let him who's on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to his get his clothes. In other words, he told them to flee for their lives. Because when they saw the armies encircling the city of Jerusalem, the destruction was imminent. And so we continue in Luke 21. In Luke's account, Jesus says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know its desolation is near. So Jesus is giving those people at that time frame ample warning that Jerusalem was not going to survive. And then we continue Luke 21. For these are their days of vengeance that all things that are written may be fulfilled. Then continuing, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. You Bible scholars, you know that the reference to Gentiles, the Jews and Gentiles, the Jews were the top of the heap, the Gentiles were in the bottom of the heap. But even still, this warning goes to both Jews and Gentiles. And we'll talk about that later. Well, in the year AD 66, approximately 30, 30 years, 33 years after Jesus gave this prediction, the Roman armies under Cestius, the Roman governor of Syria, came to put down a rebellion that had broken out in Jerusalem. And as they laid siege against the city, the city withstood the ravages of the Roman army, and finally the Romans, the Roman armies withdrew, despairing of actual being able to, to take the city. That's in Church History Book 3 from Eusebius. Now those who followed the instructions given by Jesus at that time, they fled the city and they escaped the slaughter. The slaughter of the inhabitants when the Roman army destroyed it four years later. They didn't succeed that first time, but four years later. And approximately a million of those people, a million of those Jews, were killed in that terrible siege in AD in 70. If only they had heeded the instructions of Jesus, that city that was, that was attacked four years, early, four years earlier, that he had made the prediction when the city survived. Now here's a striking lesson on the importance of studying and, and believing prophecies. You see, those who believed Christ and watched for the signs foretold were saved, because there's a whole lot of them that followed the words of Jesus, followed his, followed his warnings. While the unbelieving the skeptics perished. Friends, I just think you can see the parallel. So it will be the end of the world. Watchful believers will be delivered while the careless unbelieving will perish. What about that magnificent temple? 
Well, Titus, the Roman general who was in charge of taking that city of Jerusalem in AD 70, he had given orders because the temple was such an unbelievably impressive facility, he didn't want to see it destroyed. And he gave orders to all of his soldiers not to destroy the temple. But one of the soldiers threw a lighted torch through a door, and unfortunately, the temple became a flaming inferno. And in order to salvage the gold that melted from the dome, ran into the masonry after the temple had burned, the amount of gold that was in that temple had run like mortar and had seeped into the cracks of those large stones. And these huge blocks of granite and marble had to be pried apart and the gold that had filled those grout lines were removed. But not one stone was left upon another. A prophecy that Jesus had been very plain, told his disciples very clearly what was going to happen, was fulfilled. Jesus' prediction to his disciples 40 years before, those instructions of Jerusalem were fulfilled exactly. Now what about the second part of that prophecy, about part of Jesus' prophecy regarding the end of the world? Listen up. See, Jesus gives a series of clear signs so that we can know when that time is very near. Again, discovering the heart of God. God wants to give us every chance. He wants to put every warning sign out there. He doesn't want us to run our little VW into, us, into a bank and kill ourselves. He puts the warning signs out there. And Jesus so also gives these warning signs, in, warning signs in very, very clear manner. Now, don't you think we better pay attention to his words? Those words we know that we've studied in prophecy yesterday or last night, all these prophecies that have been fulfilled, that have come true, if they've all been fulfilled, prophesied and come true, and there's only a few left that haven't, I think our faith needs to be that they're going to happen. So let's take a look at some of these signs of our time. The first one I want to focus in on is the, the signs of political strife and conflict. Yeah, in my short lifetime, it seems like in the last few decades, it has gotten crazy. And many of you know my background. My wife and I are both from the Ukraine. We can't figure out what's going on there. Nations rising against nations was one of the signs that Jesus said would happen. In Matthew 24, 7, Jesus said, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. Friends, the 20th century has been the bloodiest century in mankind's history. You know, it's for us to say, oh, there's always been wars and nations fighting against nations. But the amount of bloodshed in the 20th century, let me give you some numbers. World War I saw 20 million people sacrificed on the altar of war. World War II witnessed the destruction of more than 50 million people. Did you get those numbers? World War II was supposed to be the war to end all wars. And though everyone throughout that violent time of year, all the violence and hatred, that they thought, well, you know, this is maybe this will end. Maybe this is it. Maybe we've seen enough bloodshed. We've seen enough of what war does or doesn't do. But look around us today. We still have wars. Science. Science hasn't solved our squabbles. Unfortunately, they've aided to them. Education hasn't solved them either. This is one of the signs of the times where everyone talks about peace, but it eludes us. So in the Bible, the Bible teaches that man's best efforts at peace will always fall short. Knows what it says in 1 Thessalonians. For when they say peace and safety, then 
sudden destruction comes upon them. The whole global war against terror has again rewritten the rules. All the disarmament treaties that have been signed between men and between nations and countries will mean absolutely nothing if powerful weapons end up in the hands of terrorists, which they already are. But increased bloodshed isn't the only sign of the last day events. See, Jesus goes on to tell of great natural disasters compounding and increasing in, in, in time and intensity to the end. Famines, Jesus said, will happen. Matthew 24, there'll be famines, and there are famines in plenty areas of our world today. I haven't seen the recent numbers, but with this war going on in, in, in the Ukraine, if anybody knows anything about the Ukraine, the Ukraine is really the breadbasket of Europe. I mean, their wheat farms and their grain, it's just, it's, they're going to be able to produce probably 10 to 15% of what they normally do. So you talk about a recipe for mass starvation and violence for food. So this, we call it a famine, whatever you'd like to call it. It's a food shortage. You know, sadly, it's estimated that 57 million people a year starve from, from Starve from starvation. Did a little bit with my calculator. That's almost 150,000 people per day dying from starvation. And here we are in America. Inventing stuff to complain about. Have you noticed that? Don't get me going on that one either. Of the 8 billion people that live in our world today, 60% are malnourished, 20% will end up diving, will end up starving. So Jesus says at the end of time, there'll be famines as one of the signs of the end. Informed sources, whatever that means, tells us that when the population outpaces food production, then worldwide famine and starvation will, will be the result. Epidemics, food wars are inevitable. How will we feed added billions when two-thirds of the world's population are hungry already? Not a, very, not a very pretty picture I'm painting tonight, is it? Luke describes it this way. He describes the growing anxiety that is caused by some of these disasters. On the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. Now, I, I just want you to know, I'm, I'm giving you the real ugly side, the kind of the downer side. But there's good news that we're going to leave you with tonight. But the next step that Jesus predicted was this increased in pestilences. And according to the dictionary, the same, the same, the, the definition, it's the same as a plague or a strange disease. Hmm. I think we don't need any reminder of the last three years and the strange disease that has infected the earth. There are many, many plagues in spite of what modern medicine is doing. I mean, for an example, AIDS and malaria and pneumonia and tuber tuberculosis, uh, Ebola, syphilis, gonorrhea, cholera, cholera covid the World Health Organization now estimates that AIDS deaths will more than double in the next two decades. Now, they haven't, I haven't picked up their latest numbers on COVID, but still, it's a negative picture. And the, the societal and economical costs of these lifestyle diseases that are called, which are the result of choices in our diet and our health habits, they're rapidly increasing, but perhaps most troubling are the diseases for which we know neither cause nor cure. So that's the world we live in. Some of these diseases are undoubtedly the result of 
the way we've polluted our planet, no doubt about it. I've um, had the privilege of traveling to a, a number of countries, and um, I can tell you, some people may point the finger that the United States is polluters. They need to go to India and the Philippines and parts of Africa and parts of South America where they're just garbage everywhere. Well, pollution, environmental pollution is a huge issue. But the Bible predicts that the world would grow old. Waxing old is what we find that it's in Isaiah. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away. The earth will grow old like a garment. <laughs> I know what it was like as a kid to wear hand-me-downs. So I know what it means like the earth will grow a worn-out garment. What better description could be given to the, to the sky and the earth as they deteriorate around us? The sky over many of our large cities, as you know, is filled with poisonous chemicals. We breathe them in our lungs. There's even signs posted in many cities that warn about the dangers of air pollution. And in many places, the water is no longer safe to drink because of all the dangerous substances that are in it. Where will we, where will we be able to get energy and pure water and air where will we get food? With the world's rapid increase in population, this world faces serious problems just surviving on earth. No wonder Jesus said these words in Luke 21. On the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. And Jesus also said that there would be increasing earthquakes as well. I don't need to go into a lot of detail about the massive amounts of earthquakes that we have seen. There will be earthquakes in various places. You realize each year there are about, and it's been increasing over the last number of decades, but they record more than 6,000 major earthquakes in the world in the last 90 years alone. Millions of fatalities. I've seen the earthquakes of some of the regions of the world that um, we would never suspect an earthquake to happen. We walked down the streets of Christ Church, New Zealand here a few years ago after the earthquake. The earthquake there in Haiti. I mean, you can kind of point your finger in the globe and you know that there will or has been an earthquake there. That earthquake in Japan a few years ago that resulted in that tsunami that just took thousands of lives. Luke 21.11, there'll be great earthquakes in various places, famines and pestilence. There will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Fearful sights. Again, it depends on your perspective. Again, here in Luke, Luke 21. And there'll be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with, perplex, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Notice it says the wind and the waves will be roaring. Wow. All over this planet, we have seen extraordinary weather. Um, typhoons with tidal waves and tsunamis and tornadoes and hurricanes and volcanoes. Now, as we talked about the other night, these are all, according to the experts, these are all acts of God. We talked about the assassination of God's character. These are acts of the evil one. These are acts of the devil. Carrying on. All of these things are taking an incredible toll on lives. But now let's go on. The Bible gives another sign. The deterioration of morality at the end of time. Jesus compared the conditions on earth to, in the last days to 
Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities that were so sinful that God had to finally, he had to destroy them with fire from heaven. Luke 17 says, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Jude, Jude 1 7, Jude wrote, Sodom and Gomorrah and the city around them, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. And Paul, speaking of the moral conditions that characterize these cities in Romans 1 26, says, even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. And Paul also says, likewise also, the men leaving the natural use of women burned their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful. Now I know that I could get myself in a lot of trouble because this is one of those topics that I could be accused of being hate speech, I'm homophobic, whatever. But friends, I'm just pointing out to you, this is what the Bible says, what the conditions in this world will be like before he comes. I'm just telling you that as we look at the events out there, this is happening in a great degree. Um, somebody may watch this thing on YouTube and I could be in lots of trouble with the social media folk out there. And then this whole notion of you can choose your gender. Friends, I'm not a rocket scientist, but there's one passage in the book of Genesis that makes it pretty plain to me. After God had created all those animals and all the birds and the fish and the butterflies, and, and he created man and woman, man and woman created he them. I don't care what you call it. You can dress it. You can cut it. You can paint it. You can do whatever you want. But friends, there's only two genders, Amen. male and female. And what our culture right now is doing to our kids in that whole discourse, there's people that need to be arrested and put behind bars for, for child endangerment and child abuse times 10. But see, this is exactly what I'm talking about. These are the things that have been, that Christ said, this is going to happen before I return. The scripture shows that describes these conditions at the end of time. This is a thus saith the Lord. Second Timothy, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal despisers of good. Oh boy, oh boy. Continues. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. We could say, you know, most of those characteristics and to describe people that are in the world. But I hate to say it. The enemy knows how to infiltrate into the church and even affect God's people that we are guilty of some of those traits ourselves. Yet the Bible predicts that the society in the last days will be this pleasure-loving, greedy society without ethical convictions, scams and frauds abound. How many of you get at least 50 scam phone calls a week on your cell phone? You know what I'm talking about? Just in that one arena alone. Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, 2 Timothy 3. Evil men and impostors. Do these verses sound 
a lot like the days we're living in today, I say amen. But in yet another sign of the last days, Christ warned about false Christs and false prophets. These false prophets who would appear to deceive the world. In Matthew, if anyone says to you, look here, here is Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Now, you know what that word elect means? That's God's chosen. That's God's people. E -e even people who surround themselves in their word, even they can be deceived. And I, I hate to say this, but that passage really, I shouldn't say haunts me, but it troubles me. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be one of those that, that um, is deceived by, by these false prophets and false Christs. First night we were together, we talked about one of the most amazing prophetic predictions about the end of the world, and that is the gospel that is going into the whole world. But today, the, 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 the world, the religious world specifically, is full of teachers that are leading many away from the word of God. There are many religions out there that have become incredibly lucrative businesses. And the lines between spirituality and entertainment are confusing. People follow the most popular preacher or the one who promises the most. One of the most well-known preachers. You see him on TV a lot. I'll keep his name to myself because I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want to have him to watch this and then call and be slandered. But he has a congregation of 50, 60, 70,000. And he espouses what is known as the prosperity gospel. That God wants everybody to be rich and wealthy and increased with goods and everything your heart desires, God wants you to have that. You heard that? I know you have. And the only reason we don't have it is because we haven't asked for it. Don't get me going on that topic because that's one for another time. But these are the false Christs and false prophets. These are the preachers out there that are that are wolves in sheep's clothing. And we need to be sure this evening, my friends, that we are following the word of God because the last and greatest of all the signs that Jesus gave was that the gospel was to be taken to the whole world. And of all the, th the signs, this is the one that hasn't been totally fulfilled yet, but it's happening in incredible ways. Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. I say praise God for that, and we shared, you know, on opening night, the incredible ways that the gospel is being spread into that region we call the 1040 window, which has 97% of the people have not heard about Jesus. That's where they live. And so the efforts to reach those people, one of the organizations, excuse me, that our family has adopted and we're in love with. If you didn't get a brochure, fr brochure Friday night, there's a little brochure on the table back there. You can ask, ask my wife for one. It's called Gospel Outreach. They have 2,200 indigenous Bible workers working that region of the world. These indigenous workers, they've grown up in these little communities. Know, they know the language. They know the culture. They know the traditions. They know the people. And people by the hundreds of thousands are, are finding Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. It just thrills my heart what's happening over there. I don't know what it's going to take here in America to wake us up. But like that game we used to play as kids, one to the, up to 100, ready or not, here I come. I think there's going to come a day very soon when Jesus is saying, it's quitting time, and ready or not, here I come. This, the book of Revelation, we find these incredible words that describes this great proclamation. 
And then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That third H's message is represented by that beautiful banner we have here in this church. The three angels' message found in the book of Revelation. Do you realize that you are seeing the fulfillment of this prophecy right here tonight at this very meeting? Because that's what we're doing. We're taking the gospel to those who are seekers, who want to know a better life. This is a part of that preaching of the everlasting gospel to every creature that we read about there. And you know, the gospel is being proclaimed on television, on radio, evangelistic meetings, the internet, private Bible studies, correspondence Bible schools, all around the globe. I was sharing with, um, I don't see her here tonight. Um, tell me your wife's name again. There's some regions of the world right now that you need to lift up in prayer. Bible workers, Christians are being persecuted at an incredible rate. Um, please lift up our Bible workers and our brothers and sisters in China. You know, we may think that's a great country in our economic the connection we have. But China is most guilty of religious persecution of any nation in the world. There are more people that have been killed, martyred, that are imprisoned. Uh, North Korea is a close second. But I'll just, and you be careful who you share this with. I, I would not want to have those people get themselves in trouble over there, but most of the, all of the, I should say, all of the pastors in China are women because it's illegal in China for men to be a bishop or a pastor. So all of our churches are, are led out by women. And this is not a time for women's ordination discussion. That's, the, 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 the women pastors there, they just, their, their attitude is, you know what? We're doing what the Lord has called us to do and we're going to do it until he comes. End of discussion. Well, so they want to have a baptism. Yeah, the government of China has built these huge churches. And they say, we have religious freedom here. And they lease out that church on a Friday night to the Baptists and Saturday morning to the Adventists and Saturday afternoon to the, to the Assemblies of God and Sunday. You get the picture. But here's the point. Those pastors that are in these official churches, they have to submit their sermon notes to the minister of religion in, the, in their government six weeks before they preach in the pulpit. And if there's anything in that sermon that has anything to do that's counter to uh, their government, those pastors are going to be arrested. So you can imagine the quality of their sermons is not real deep. It's pretty much just fluff. And that is why the church in China is growing so rapidly in the home churches. In China right now, it's illegal to have an 18-year-old and under attend any, any church, any denomination. If they are caught going to a church, the state declares them wards of the court. They're stripped from their families, and their families will never see them again. So now the, the Adventist or the Christian grapevine gets into action. So tonight we're meeting with uh, at Jim Miller's house, and we're going to be having some, we're going to have a supper together. And um, if, the, if the authorities show up, uh, we're having a birthday party. We're celebrating the birthday of Jesus. They won't tell them that. Next week, where are we meeting? So they're still able to conduct. So here's this pastor of a church, one of the recognized churches. They want to conduct a baptism, so they go down to the, 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 the 
park in the city there that has a, a pond, and here the people are, are dressed, ready for baptism. And here come the authorities, here comes the police, and they're all arrested and taken to jail. Okay, so now what do we do? And this happens more times than you can count. So just to give you an idea, just to give you an example how God is even working under those horrible conditions. So here's this one, one lady. She has a home church. Every week, she has people coming in. They have Bible studies. They sing. People want to give their heart to Jesus. We want to be baptized. No place to be baptized. So she gives Jim Miller a call or a handyman like Jim Miller and says, I want you to come to my home. I want to remodel my kitchen. It's a raised foundation. And in the middle of my kitchen floor, I want you to install a soaking tub. That's what she called it. I want it about three feet wide, about six feet long, and about two and a half feet deep. I want to be able to drain it. In the kitchen? Yes, that's where I'd like it. So sure enough, the carpenters, they come in there, they build it. They finish it. Friends, in that little home, in the last three years, more than 600 people have given their heart to Jesus who have been baptized in that one lady's home. And that's one of thousands. I don't know what it does to your heart, but it just shows me that God has a God has a way much beyond our understanding. I'll give you another example. So North Korea. Adventist World Radio, along with Gospel Outreach, they've developed this little solar powered radio, they call it a talking Bible. They have, they can uh, download all of the Bible, uh, health lectures, family talks, uh, kids stuff. On this little, you can't destroy this thing. You could drive a semi over that thing and it, it would survive. It's solar powered. And when the wind is blowing just in the right direction, a whole bunch of the Christians in South Korea have a whole bunch of these hot air balloons and they attach all these little radios, these talking Bibles, to these hot air balloons and they launch them and they end up somewhere in North Korea. Well, wouldn't you know a whole bundle of those happen to land in a military base? Uh-oh. More than a hundred of those military soldiers now want Bibles and they want to study about Jesus. So don't be discouraged. We are living in a time that Jesus foretold. We're living in these last days when these last great events taking place around us are going to be thrilling. But time is running out. You know, Jesus compared our day to the, the time we're living in to the days of Noah. And you know that story, the people who lived in Noah's day, they were busy making living and doing all the daily things. And, you know, there's Noah building this boat, this never saw rain. He's building this 120 years it takes him. By the way, I mentioned this the other night too. All those archaeological discoveries that we were telling you about, hundreds and hundreds of those cultures have stories of a flood and, and of a big boat. That say, anyway just to get off track a little bit. But the people there in Noah's day, they were living life just from day to day. Matthew 24, but as it was in the days of Noah, also, so also will be coming, I know it, I'm saying it in a different translation, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns, when he comes again. Whereas in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And then what happened? Well, did not know until the flood, flood came and took them all away. So also will the 
coming of the Son of Man be? We understand Noah was in the ark there for seven days. Can you imagine all the people outside making fun of him? Oh, you are a foolish old man. You know, you talking about, you know, a phenomena that we've never experienced in this world. That same phenomena, phenomena exists among unbelievers. You believe about you, you, the, this, this supernatural, this Jesus is going to return and he's going to come and he's going to take all of his people with him. And the, they think it's a fairy tale. But Jesus predicted that in the last days, people would be having a, a great time, great time, but having no time for God. That they would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And friends, as we look around the world today, we can certainly see that we're, we're close to the second coming of Jesus. Amen. Today, things aren't much different than they were the first time Jesus came to earth. He came to his own, and his own didn't know him. Sad to say, that's where we are today. Let's not be like the people back then. Let's be ready for his second coming. We'll be talking about that in a few nights. He's given us all of these signs which say he's coming soon. Jesus said, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. There's a story that's a tragic story. There's a steamship, it's called the Central America. It sailed out of New York Harbor and was heading south in the Atlantic towards South America, towards the Panama Canal, when she sprang a leak. There's another ship that saw her distress signal and steamed up to help, and the captain of the rescue ship sent over a message. What's amiss? That's the old English for what's wrong? What's your problem? Well, the answer came back. We're in bad repair, we have a leak, and we're going down, lie by till morning. The captain of that rescuing ship could see the steamship listing, and he replied, well, let me take your passengers with, passengers with you right now. Have them board now. But the night had fallen, and they didn't have any of these fancy lights that we have today, and the captain of the Center America didn't want to take the risk of losing some of those pastor, passengers, transferring them in the dark. And he repeated again, lie by till morning. Again, the other captain sent a message insisting that action should be taken right now. But he still refused. So he had to wait some distance off in the gathering night. And his staff on the bridge could make out the lights of the Central America bobbing in the waves. And about an hour and a half later, they watched aghast as those lights disappeared, the ship having gone down and all on board perishing. To wait, friends, may result in being eternally lost. I don't know what the timetable is on my schedule in my life. I do know this. I don't like opening my computer or my phone. He says, there's an email or a memo from somebody somewhere that somebody I know has died again. There are times when it's important for us to make a decision now. The captain of that Central America thought that there was no problem waiting until morning. Sadly, he was tragically mistaken. The Bible says, the words of Jesus, today is the day of salvation. I just want to encourage all of you here. I don't know what, where you are in your journey, but friends, don't hesitate. Don't delay. Why not make your, your decision for Christ right now? Maybe you've made it once, and maybe you've slipped. Maybe you've come back. I don't know where you are, but now is the accepted time. 
I wonder if you'd lift your hand and your heart to God right now to say, you know, Lord, I want you to help prepare me for that soon coming of Jesus. It's right around the corner. Tonight I want to, I want to say to Jesus, thank you for providing a Savior for me for, from certain death that God has made it all, all possible. I just want to let you say, I just want to say, Jesus, you're my all. If that's your desire, please join me in that prayer. And I want you to stand and keep your hands raised as, as I have a prayer. With our hands raised, dear Lord, I just want, you, I want to thank you for giving us these signs, these signs that warn us, that tell us that the end is near. Promises that you are coming again and you'll save all those who trust and obey you. Oh well, Lord, thank you. We want you to come soon because we don't want to put it off any longer. This world has nothing to offer. Tonight we want to give you permission to save us from ourselves. Help us among all of those that we, those that we love, our, our family, our friends, our kids, our, our spouse, whoever it might be, help us to be an example that they will also too want to be ready to meet Jesus. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' wonderful and holy name. And everybody said together, amen. amen. Please be seated. So let's just take another half a minute tonight. What have we discovered? As we're looking at this theme of discover the heart of God. I, uh, I just am so grateful for the patience and for the long suffering and for the determination that God has placed in his holy word to give us all the information we need to be ready. The signs of his coming. He doesn't want us to be fearful. And I'm so grateful for a God in whom I can trust. I'm grateful for the fact that even though I don't understand a lot of it, there's still a whole lot to come. I do know this. My conscious decision every day, Lord, here I am. I'm yours. Do with me what you please.